see, uh, oops, sorry. Commissioner Pitt, I'd like to call to order the Watershed Planning Commission meeting for August 28th, 2023. It's 4 p.m. First item on the agenda is to approve of the agenda and the meeting minutes as they were distributed. Any discussion or questions? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to approve both the agenda and the minutes uh, as distributed. This is Mr. Schmidt, I'm going to motion to approve. Is there a second to that motion? Commissioner Beerling, I'll second that. Wait, can we do a uh, roll call vote? Absolutely, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Pint? Aye. Commissioner Casillas? Aye. Commissioner Thill? I'll come back to you, Joe. Commissioner Schmidt? Aye. Commissioner Vierling? Aye. And Commissioner Thill? Abstain. There you go. Thank you. Next item on the agenda then will be informational media, uh, reports by that, starting out with SWCD, uh, either Troy or a uh, spokesman for Troy for SWCD. Hello, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Yes, thank you, Troy. Hi, good, thank you. Sorry about that. I just jumped on and um, I'm not sure what camera it was going to or mic. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just getting some highlights from the report for August. Um, you can see the technical assistance and car share requests. Uh, these are just the WMO and previous reports. I included all from other uh, watershed districts as well. So, I just paired out the ones from the WMO. Uh, so you can see we're just slightly above 140 active service requests and about 90 plus uh, of those are projects. So Health Cover Crop Initiative, we prepared and analyzed, uh, advertised for the um, annual aerial and highway cover crop seedings. This is where we do group seeding and, and pool uh, more um, landowners that together that want to do cover crop seeding and try to get better performance and scale pricing. Uh, this year, we're introducing the highway, which is a land driven machine that just uh, goes over the top of the crops and puts seed more directly on the ground versus aerial. It's, uh, it's corn. We're hoping to get better uh, seed to soil contact and therefore germination with the highway. Uh, let's see, we see a new request for uh, water quality certification. So that's the uh, Minnesota Department of Ag program. and. Cover crops is often incorporated into that. So one thing I want to point out is the chart there. I started uh, adding this chart based on a request, I think, from one of the commissioners uh, two or three months ago. Uh, and what this report does is track the number of, of, of soil health practices that we've logged and are working with landowners on. You can see it kind of fluctuates over the years. Uh, 2023, we're you know a little better than halfway through the year, and we're just above 750 acres so far. So, any questions or comments regarding that chart, what it shows, just please let me know. Uh, Clean Water Education Program. We hosted our mid-summer meeting. That was a highlight back on July 27th. Um, we also did a conservation lesson plan for 20 high schoolers through the conservation in the classroom program. Submitted a few articles in the Scott County scene. We do that uh, on a regular basis. I think they're quarterly now. And we're, of course, preparing for the upcoming outdoor education request the last week of September. They've left the, and a lot of prep work goes into that, especially this year now that we have new lessons plans. Uh, that skip down to uh, training. Continue to collect bio weekly samples at the uh, two main sites at Fred River. That's 154 and 358. Um, we also have one event sample. We grab uh, an event sample when there's a significant rainfall event that produces runoff. Um, and we also collected a monthly Florida E. coli sample, synoptic samples for 14 of the 16 sites, uh, noting that two of those sites were dry, so we couldn't collect. Um, 
city of Prior Lake is the Markley Lake Project. Um, it's a cooperative one. We're uh, continuing to download bi-weekly the water quality monitoring data. We did have to move the sensor deeper into the lake due to the water levels dropping. Otherwise, what happens is that sensor sits above the lake level and doesn't move. Uh, moving down to construction erosion control, um, you can see the number of uh, inspections reached nearly 300 for the month of uh, July. Uh, plan reviews dropped a bit from June of the previous month uh, down to around 10 or 12 new plan reviews. Uh, wetland conservation, uh, not a heavy workload there, but we still continue to see a trickle of activity there in terms of uh, the water levels in the in the bank are actually very good. Um, with the recent, the most recent rainfall, I, you know, several weeks ago, of course. But anyway, the water levels were actually above the um, the design level of where the weir is at. So it was flowing over the weir, which was um, obviously we were happy to see that given how dry it's been. Uh, the other issue we were facing, though, um, was uh, just a, a strong uh, showing of Canadian thistle this year, and we had to do a lot of spraying. We, we suspect that maybe some of the more droughty weather, dry weather conditions, lead to more of the infestation of thistle, but we're not 100 percent sure about that. We'll be down the equipment rental program. I'll just touch on that. Uh, we've surpassed our past the thousand acres so far this year. Uh, so I think we're going to see another uh, strong year like we have the past two years. It's just a good barometer for how much uh, how much landowners and cooperatives are doing with respect to um, seeding native prairies or putting in cover crops <coughs> and no-till. Uh, we have, uh, as shown in the table there, a little over $927,000 in total awards out there. Um, spent about 50% of that, so we're sitting at about $385,000, $600 total between Stone Water and Bevermore. So those are funds that are available to be spent on commercial tax And then if we go down to the final page there, first or final one or two pages, is the, um, the table showing the payments and the new applications that were considered by the board. Uh, keep in mind, these are both July and August, since we skipped the July meeting. I'm reporting that for both months, both of the past month of uh, board meetings. Uh, so total for July and August, the board um, $51,336 in payments and $26,000 worth of new applications. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'll try to answer any questions. Any uh, follow-up questions uh, for Troy? If not, we'll move on to then the WMO uh, information update, Vanessa. Thank you, Mr. Chair and commissioners. Um, thank you, Troy. So I, I'll probably overlap just a slight bit here and there and we will during the meeting. Um, but lots of good things going on. Uh, first thing I do want to mention is the county does hold a volunteer appreciation picnic every year. This year it is September 19th, which is a Tuesday. Uh, but it's from 4 to 7 p.m. at the county fairgrounds. Um, love to see you all there if you're available, um, just to show your appreciation and our thanks. Uh, so that's one way the county likes to, you know, say thank you for all the hard work that you do. Um, second thing, as Troy mentioned, there's a couple of great things coming up uh, in September. Both of them happen to be on the same week. Uh, one is our outdoor education days uh, that we sponsor with the Soil Water Conservation District and our other partners. Um, as Troy mentioned, uh, 
we had that Clean Water Fund grant uh, to help kind of overhaul the different education plans um, that are taught at Outdoor Ed Days and then tried to align them with current standards to make them more useful and functional for the teachers and the students and the districts. Um, so I'm really excited to see those go into play this year. Um, WMO staff all shows up to volunteer for at least one day uh, during Outdoor Ed. So that's always a fun one. Uh, also, uh, that same week is the Children's Water Festival. Now that's something that Scott County does, uh, the WMO does in partnership with Hennepin, um, uh, actually Hennepin, Dakota, Rice, uh, and Carver, all the all uh, metro counties. Um, and that's actually held at the state fairgrounds. We did it last year. This is our second year again, helping to host that. Um, that's a few thousand students. Um, it's a huge day and it's a lot of fun. So that brings in students from all over the metro, also including uh, students from our own districts here. Um, and that has educators uh, across the board from DNR, Met Council, um, professional educators just in, in uh, natural resources. But um, that's another fun day that staff helps kind of tries to bring our current age of stewards uh, into where we are now and help grow good stewards for the future. So that's coming up again at the end of September. Uh, third thing uh, that we are currently working on, last year we uh, kind of tried to update our our rates, our fees for, you know, um, erosion sediment control and grading permits. Uh, we hadn't updated our fees in over 10 years and um, the, the program hopefully gets enough fees uh, to try to kind of cover the cost of operating the program. So it zeroes out at the end of every year. Unfortunately, um, for the last few years, the program has been struggling. It's the county's side of natural resources that it pays to operate the things that it's regulated and required to operate. And so, you know, we, we last year we updated those kind of uh, those smaller fees. Uh, this year we're starting to look at the other two big ones, which are our stormwater fees and our groundwater fees. Those are the larger development fees that we usually charge as development comes in. Um, those were actually originally based upon like an early 2000s study. Uh, we did update them a little bit in uh, 2014, um, but we're looking at trying to bring them current now. And so bringing them current just simply means that um, what we are charging uh, overall helps pay for the cost of the program. So the program can zero out again. Because when the program doesn't zero out, it means the county general levy has to supplement uh, the cost of operating its regulatory programs. So obviously we'd rather not do that if we don't have to. Um, because both the groundwater and stormwater fees are rather large um, and complex in how we decide, uh, we will probably take those on one piece at a time. We'll probably update the groundwater fee first. Um, mostly because we're looking at updating our groundwater plan. And that's something that staff is starting to work on um, now that uh, we know that the Elko New Market um, planning and efforts are well underway and that we won't conflict with that or cause them any undue hardship or confusion with that planning process. Uh, we feel pretty comfortable to move forward with our groundwater plan. So we'll look at updating that coming up next. And then um, in a couple of years, we'll probably look at updating the stormwater fee. Um, and again, that's the county portion, not the WMO levy. That's something we'll talk about in just a little bit here. Um, obviously also too, we did the Set County Fair. I don't know if you caught that from what Troy was saying. Um, staff worked with the Set County Fair and Melissa did another great job of putting together a display for the Scott County Fair this year. Um, it was hot. I think it was 150 when I was there. <laughs> Maybe not literally 150 degrees. It just felt like 150 degrees. Uh, but people were still, you know, in actually good spirits. Uh, people were still, you know, wanting to talk about water and recycling and things like that. So it was still a great event. I love the county fair. That's just me. I like the county fairs even better than the state fair. But that's me. Uh, but it was a great time. Uh, just a couple other things. Uh, obviously, we're still participating in the Met Council Steering Committee for their 2050 plan um, on the Water Policy Planning Committee for that. And then they also have a new one, which is the Sub-Regional Groundwater 
subcommittee, I might have just said that. <laughs> but it's for uh, kind of the Scott County area of groundwater planning uh, for Met Council. So we're, that one just kind of kicked off as well. And those are doing well and moving along um, with all the other partners. And then finally, uh, Ryan's computer is new and his uh, camera isn't working yet. <laughs> so we apologize for that. But I do get to introduce you really briefly to our new admin assistant. Nicole Jacobson is here. Um, she comes to us all the way from uh, most recently the city of Medina, but she's got a lot of amazing, wonderful skills and we're so excited to have her. Uh, this is actually only her second day. So she's just here to listen in today. Um, but then obviously moving forward, you'll start to see, um, you know, the meeting invites and the information come from her um, and as well as packets and things like that and many other areas that hopefully we can get her to help in on. Now she is only part time. So uh, we don't want to, <laughs> we don't, we don't want to take on more than she can handle, but uh, we're so excited to have her and we desperately need her. So welcome Nicole. Thank you. I'm excited to work with Scott County and get to know all of you and the projects that you're involved in. Um, and I will say, we do like the fact that you love the outdoors. So <laughs> we appreciate that in the work that we do. And with that, I stand for any questions. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, any commissioners have questions for Vanessa to clarify or follow up with? While you're thinking about that, I will, on behalf of the Watershed Planning Commission, it's Nicole, you said the name? Yeah, Nicole, welcome you to the great staff that we have here in Scott County. And we'll try to be very, very nice and not try to pile too much work onto you. So welcome. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions for Vanessa? If not, we can move on to the uh, program updates by Ryan. Chair, commissioners, uh, good afternoon. Uh, start off with um, an update on our CIPs. So uh, there's a lot of work that's been going on. Uh, with um, the Xanadu project in particular. Uh, that's the one that we're going to construction this fall. So uh, we're in the process of putting together the bid packet uh, for that project. And the bid packet um, is, is basically everything uh, that the contractor has to follow, whether it be um, uh, guidelines or requirements from our grant partners, uh, so following state guidelines um, for Bowser, or county policies um, from everything in between uh, that we have to uh, incorporate that into the document. So it's well documented um, during the process that we can always point to whatever that might pop up on the project that um, whether it's specifications of the design or permits, uh, you name it. It's a pretty big, uh, it ends up being pretty big, a few hundred pages uh, long. And so right now we're, we've got a great team. So our transportation uh, services department does a lot of these projects, um, you know, between road projects and overlays and in and, and everything that they're doing. So they've got staff that are doing this on a pretty regular basis and we lean on them uh, a decent amount to kind of um, help us along. And then also we've got Megan Tasca, who splits her time between natural resources and the transportation department uh, that uh, she's been helping and, and very instrumental. And, and obviously um, Vanessa and Melissa help uh, with the project as well, too. So uh, we are looking to advertise for, uh, so we are required to advertise for three weeks. Um, and our first uh, week that we're looking to have it advertised would be next week, um, September 7th. And so with that, everything you kind of work back um, from that date. And so this Thursday, the advertisement is actually due to the paper uh, to make it into that, uh, that edition. And so that is when the bid packet is supposed to be complete as well. So um, we're kind of in the last few days of, of getting that um, pulled together. Uh, we've got Interflu that is providing the design um, and they're trying to get that over to us by Wednesday. So everything will kind of come together here at the last minute, I'm hoping. And 
and so that's kind of the, the big thing right now is getting that project ready to go. So although we're probably not going to start construction until November, um, there's a there's quite a bit of work that uh, to get it ready to that point. Um, so if we get an acceptable bid, um, which would be at the end of September, we would be uh, opening those. Then we would go to the county board in October with a contract with that contractor and then set a pre-con meeting, probably late October, early November, uh, giving the contractor the largest window that we can um, to get out there and actually do the construction. So we would like them to be out of the stream by uh, February 28th, just because in March, you know, things can start to melt and not ideally the best spot to be with equipment in, in a stream. So we're hoping to give them about a three to four month window to complete construction. And that's about what we're also anticipating it's going to take. So it's, this project's a little bit bigger than some of the last ones that we've completed. So it's going to take a little bit, a little bit more time. Um, so I guess I'll stop right there to see if there's any questions on that uh, particular CIP, since it's kind of the, the big one that uh, we're moving forward with right now. Thank you, Ryan. Commissioners, do you have any follow-up questions for Ryan on the project? Just to refresh our memory, this will be just upstream from the project we did on Porter a couple years so ago? It's a it's about, um, I think it's two to 300 feet downstream. Oh, downstream. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So it's a great, um, Mr. Chair, it's a, it's a great, uh, question. Um, and you would, you would think it would make it a little bit easier that they're, they're basically like right next to each other. Right. Um, but, but you still got to go through all those, those same documents and pull everything together. So, uh, some of it was helpful. Uh, you know, some of the easement language and stuff that that was a little bit, a um, little bit easier. And and uh, we'll be recording those as well this week, too. Um, but yes, yep, they're right next to each other. So we should be fairly familiar with the site. Yes. Um, with that, I'll continue on with the updates. Uh, so the other CIP that the Pika Creek one. Um, that one's between 30 and 60% design. Uh, we're still kind of working through some of the permitting uh, side of things. So um, we're hoping to get uh, some of the rock check dams, uh, those locations from the consultant, and then I can mark them in the field. And then we'll be doing a TEP meeting um, to kind of go over that and the impacts of those and, and what it all means. Um, so that one too is moving along. Having conversations with the landowners, um, everybody seems to still be on board um, with that. And so once I get the 60%, send those out to the landowners as well and um, keep that keep that project moving. And, and hopefully then by um, next time uh, this year, or this time next year, we are getting that one ready for uh, construction, uh, winter construction as well. Um, also, just a couple of things. So uh, macro invertebrate monitoring, this will be our third year of uh, starting the program. And this has kind of been the, historically the time of the year that we've been collecting uh, our samples. And so uh, the bid packet's kind of um, taking precedence right now, get that ready to go. But then immediately once that's done, I'll be shifting gears to start collecting our samples for this year. So we've got four sites. Um, two on Sand Creek, one on Credit River, and one on Pika Creek. So um, that will get going. And then um, the last thing is the, our fish survey. And I think this is actually rolled into the project updates. Um, and so I don't know if, Mr. Chair, if we want to announce specifically this item since it's on the agenda or whether I should just go right into it. Um. No, I would announce it if you're done with the other uh, okay. project updates. Yes, that that's it. That's all I have. I'll stand for any questions. Okay. Right. Any other questions to Ryan first on those CPI projects? If not, the next item on the agenda is the uh, fish survey. So we're going to give us a little background on that because I know we talked about this a while back. Um, and this is something that we knew we were going to be planning on. So I'm anxious to hear the results. Dear commissioners, yes. So this has been sort of um, uh, an item 
that uh, personally I've, I've wanted to look at for a number of years. And it really just stems from a lot of these stream bank projects. Um, and uh, way back when, when I was an intern for the soil and water, I, I, um, I walked all the major streams in Scott County. And so I've spent a fair amount of time um, on the streams and I've just noticed that there is um, just in my visual observations, a diversity difference um, between downstream of the falls in Jordan and upstream. Um, I notice a lot of recreational fishing going on downstream of the falls. Um, really don't hear of people fishing it upstream of the falls. Really don't see it either. Um, partly that might be due to there's just less public property. Um, but also I, I wanted to just dig in a little bit further and, and see if there is a difference between uh, diver you know, the species, size, numbers, quantities, you know, is there a difference between up and downstream of the falls? Um, one would suspect there would be because that is a fish barrier. You know, there's no way for the fish to actually um, get up past the falls. Uh, did find out through our consultant that we hired to do the work that there was a fish ladder at one time um, there's actually a news article I could um, share it with anybody that's interested, but there was a, a fish ladder, um, and I believe it started to deteriorate in the 60s. And so at one time there was uh, something that allowed the fish to kind of come up. And so that's ultimately what we're just kind of looking at is if there is a difference in diversity, size, is it something we want to explore the ability to let fish, you know, move up and downstream of the falls, you know, would, is that something the public is interested in? Um, so that's what we're kind of looking at. We need, we need the data to support that before we could, um, before we could even pursue something along those lines. So um, with that, I can just kind of jump into what we did and uh, what we kind of found with the results. Um, so we did our surveying a couple weeks ago, it was on August 9th and 10th, um, and our consultant is Mount Hood Environmental, and they enlisted um, several students and then one of their admin staff from the University of Minnesota to help with the surveys. So there was a fair amount of people um, that were out there. Vanessa and her son also uh, joined as well. Um, I did inform the city of Jordan because they thought they might have some of their planners or interns that would be interested in um, coming out there to take a peek, uh, but they they uh, never showed up. So um, it could be that they were just busy or, or their schedules didn't allow it, but um, we'll continue to work with them. You know, they they would be our partners on any sort of project. So I wanna make sure to keep them uh, obviously informed as well. Um, and it, you know what, it was a pretty fun uh, time to be out there. Um, not too many days are you in a stream, uh, electroshocking fish and, and kind of counting them and seeing what we got. So uh, we can jump right into the PowerPoint. So the setting, um, we're in the city of Jordan. Uh, for anybody that's not familiar, there's a waterfall right uh, down at Lagoon Park. And um, we had four locations downstream of the waterfalls where we did a pre-survey, found that there was likely going to be some good spots to to do some of the seining and electroshocking and then also uh went upstream and found three locations uh that that made for good spots to to do the same thing as well so seining and electroshocking so this is just a shot upstream so this would be the <clears throat> uh, bridge right by the new roundabout that they're uh looking to uh or they're uh, under construction on right now and then this would be downstream by the Rice Street Bridge, which would be right behind the uh, Minimet uh, baseball field. So um, and, and that particular location was was uh, the most fun out of all of them for the uh, for the electroshocking. And we kind of knew that there's a pretty good hole there. So if you want to go catch some decent sized uh, northern pike and walleye, there's actually some pretty, pretty big fish um, that are hanging out just in this little the little stretch of the stream right there. Uh, so, uh, like I said, the methods that we use, seining would be one, so that would just be just the use of a net that they drop down into the water and then um, pull that net in and then collect the fish that way. 
Um, we did more of the electroshocking. So you can see the backpack here where you've got the rod that they stick into the water um, and it sends out a little bit of electricity that temporarily shocks the fish um, and allows you to capture them in the net. So the bottom right picture, you can see they're intensely looking to uh, grab the fish with their nets and, uh, and, and they were pretty excited to, to do the work. So it was fun to see. Uh, this is just some shots of everybody catching uh, the fish. So you've just got a net here with a bunch of different kinds of species. Um, we got a sucker and a bluegill, it looks like, and some bullheads. Um, but it just kind of goes to show what how they're doing it. So you just kind of uh, stand right behind the person with the backpack, and um, you kind of see the fish flip over, and you'll see the white of their bellies, and that's kind of when you start sticking the net in there and trying to grab them. And it's not easy. You lose quite a, a, a bit of the fish. Uh, they skirt around you um that they you know that they, they don't get shocked um well enough that you can actually capture them um so yeah it, it there was a challenge to this uh it took a little bit to get used to it ryan yes did you did you want to point out that you were actually in that photo oh okay i know uh, you're just gonna slide right by there yeah, but so I they bet the commissioners from... would appreciate knowing that you got some mm -hmm. great education and experience yourself and you did a darn good job. <sighs> the goofball in the uh, neon vest, that would be me that's doing some yeah, uh, electric shock. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So it was fun. They, uh, so Sean's the gentleman standing right next to me in the blue shirt and uh, he um, is our consultant, the main person that we're working with. And he was really good. He let um, he let everybody kind of try it. Um, if you wanted to, you know, work with the net, um, do the electroshocking, or there's a bucket too. You don't really see it in any of these photos, but after they get pulled out of the water, you got to stick them into a bucket. And so, um, so yeah, the the more people actually, the better on this one. Uh, we could have could have probably even used a couple more people and would have been able to get more fish. Vanessa, thank you for pointing that out. Vanessa added that photo into my into the PowerPoint here. Uh, so the, the fun part was the collecting uh, the data. This is the maybe not as fun. So this takes a long time for them to, to go through because most of these species are a couple inches uh, long. And the you know the most common species that are found are your minnows, shiners, um, suckers, daces, uh, more of your smaller, but not your game fish. Uh, so there's a lot less of that. Or even if you do get game fish, walleye or largemouth bass, they're typically fairly small. There's very few of them that are uh, the larger, you know, even anything over eight inches was pretty rare to be pulling out of the creek. So when you did get those, they were it was quite fun. But this would take them hours to to collect this data, identify them, get the sizes, and then Sean in the bottom, the middle bottom picture, you can see he's holding up a clear container with water. And if you look closely, there's a fish in it. He took pictures of every species that um, that they pulled out, and so that's not yet available. It will be with the report, and I'll be sure to share that with everybody. But I thought that was kind of neat that we'll get a picture of every single one. So if you're not familiar with, um, you know, what maybe a species uh, is, we'll, we'll have a nice picture of, of what they look like. And so here is where we actually got, uh, that's that hole right by Rice Street that uh, we got actually a fair amount of pretty good sized fish. So the top left would be Vanessa's son, Edison. And he's holding a decent sized walleye. That was one of the bigger ones that we pulled out. Uh, however, on our pre-survey, we saw some that were quite a bit bigger than that. Uh, so a little shocking to me. I didn't realize that there were that size of walleye um, in the creek. So it was cool to see. Um, and then obviously Northern Pike, and then there's a gizzard shad, and then a bluegill are the other ones that are getting measured there. So, um, Kind of neat too, when we were there, uh, Sean talked to a gentleman that was fishing just below the falls and he said he pulled out a 40 inch 
mus uh yeah musky out of there and i thought that that's just incredible i never realized that musky actually were were in the creek so um it was kind of neat to see and i talked to one of the contractors that was working on the roundabout and he said when he looks down from that bridge that was in the first photo he can see northern pike and walleye and he said musky too he can see them upstream of the falls so it was kind of neat to to kind of hear from stories of other people too and and we didn't get any muskie in our survey, but uh, maybe in future years, we'll be able to pull some of them out. Uh, so here's just some of the species that we found. Um, at the time I was writing this, I didn't know exactly the number that we had, but there was 35 different species that were found. Um, and uh, kind of the larger ones were, were the large enough bass, the walleye, pike, bluegill, black crappie, um, carp, and uh, yellow perch were all found. Um, so, and then I also didn't have this at the time of the um, getting the PowerPoint ready. Can everyone see the graph that I just threw up there? Nope. Okay. Let me share. Stop sharing, and then I'm going to share this screen. So this uh, on the top shows upstream of the falls, and on the bottom portion, that is the um, that's the downstream side. And so you can see that there's a huge difference. So th these would be all 35 of the species that were found. So the downstream side, all 35 found. Upstream side, I mean, that was 13. Yes, 13. So you got 13 species on the upstream side versus 35 on the downstream side. So I thought that was pretty telling um, that, that there was just so many more species that were downstream. And Sean was saying that um, Met Council, I think, was doing some surveying, or no, MPCA, sorry, MPCA was doing some surveying on Sand Creek, and they found closer to the river, it was around 40 species. So, um, you know, we didn't even hit the highest number of, of species that, that, um, that, you know, people that have done these surveys have even found. So it'd be kind of neat to keep doing this for a few more years and and see if we can't up our the species that that we keep finding. So I uh, thought that was pretty interesting. And I'll share one more, and then I'll stop rambling. If you can't tell, I was pretty excited about uh, doing this project. <clears throat> okay. Bear with me. All right, and then here is the, um, once again, it's comparing up and downstream the size. Um, so on the bottom, you can see the length and you can see the downstream side. And, and this is, they're focusing more on your larger fish. So you notice there's not the white suckers and the, you know, the some of the minnows, mud minnows or creek chubs or anything like that. So this is just sort of the bigger, more of the game fish. And you can see the upstream, they did find one walleye, which was neat to see. Um, and they've got a, a bullhead, but you can see just how many more um, they found downstream. And then also the lengths of those were so much uh, bigger than than the upstream side. So both graphs, uh, very telling, I think, um, kind of supports what, what our thoughts were um, with everything. And so our thought was that we probably need several years of data. So we're probably gonna be doing this um, at least two more years before I think we can really formulate a good, strong, solid um, opinion on it. And then I guess, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes from there. Um, uh, one other thing, uh, that people will find this interesting. So, <clears throat> and then I promise I'm done. <laughs> there was a photo pulled. So that is from 1888. And you can see behind the, the gentlemen that are there, that's what the falls look like back then. So 
very different um, than what it looks like today. So obviously it's been altered, you know, a number of times through the years, but kind of neat to see a historic picture like that. And with that, I'll stand for any questions. Thanks, Ryan. Very informative and a very, very interesting. So any questions or follow up for Ryan? Um, Ryan, this is Pam. I, I have two uh, questions. On the on one of your graphs, there was a between upper and lower. There were some color indicators and like intolerant, sensitive, whatever. I don't I don't understand what that means. Um, so maybe you could enlighten me. Yes, uh, Monsieur Commissioner Caselius. So there are certain species that are um, more or less tolerant of pollutants in the water, and so it's. Part of what we're doing this for is, um, it is I, I just don't see the recreational side of things being used on the upstream end. So that would be more of like a game fish, but also we're doing so much work in the water quality side of things that if we were to continue this surveying or even periodic surveying uh, into the future, it would be similar to like water quality monitoring where the presence or lack thereof of certain species would be a water quality indicator. It's sort of like what we're doing with the macro monitoring. You're using biological features uh, to also uh, indicate how, um, how, I guess, good the quality of the water is. And so that's another piece of it is we wanted them to capture, you know, are there certain species that they're finding that are not very tolerant of pollutants and their presence there would be a good sign then for water quality. Okay. Does that, that makes sense? Yeah, that makes great sense. The other quick question I have is just your thoughts around, and, and especially it was seeing the, the very old photo versus the setting you guys were in now, what you guys thought about if how different the survey would be if the water volume was much greater, the water depth was much greater. Mr. Uh, Commissioner Casillas, yes. Yeah, so um, there is a fine line between this, and I learned a lot. So Sean thought by the water levels being lower that it is possible that some of the bigger fish, they sense those water levels dropping, and they'll start to move downstream, which isn't good for our survey. So we thought about actually... Uh, maybe in future years, we might do some surveying in June because you don't want to go out there when it's too deep and murky. You know, if you got high flows, it's hard to see the fish. Even just walking, if you stir it up enough, it's really difficult to capture the fish. So you need flows to be low or, um, but if we get out there earlier, will we capture different species that maybe only come up for a little bit and then leave? Or as water levels drop, they leave too. So it's a great question. Um, I think we're going to mix it up a little bit in the future to try to, the goal is just to try to get as many species as we can out there to get the most representation. And we might move around a little bit too. There's, there's um, we could go closer to the river. Uh, maybe we'll find more species there, um, or we can go further upstream as well. So um, we're we're still so new in this, and I'm learning quite a bit. Sean's been a great resource, uh, so I think it'll evolve and hopefully improve as we continue um, collecting the data. Great, sounds like fun. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Any other follow up questions for Ryan? Thank you, Ryan. Very, very nice presentation. Appreciate and look forward to the final report. Mr. Chair? Yes. I, I just had a, not a question, but a, but an initial uh, comment. Go ahead, yes. Is that okay, Ms. Speak. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Um, I thought it was really interesting too, of the different, um, how they categorize the different species of whether they were tolerant or intolerant. It was interesting to see that there are a few species that are um, intolerant of bad water quality. So that was a good sign to see. Um, I think it's important that we continue this monitoring because um, we have several stretches of Sand Creek that are impaired for fish bioassessments and for macroinvertebrates. And that's going to be kind of the next phase eventually that we're going to have to get into is um, helping to improve those impairments. So 
you know, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency only does sampling in our watershed like once every 10 years. So they're taking just a small snapshot in time. If we have this data, if we're collecting this data on either an annual or even um, every couple of years, we have more evidence and data to show that there is improvements. Um, if, you know, the next time the Im impaired waters list um, comes around, we can actually make justification that, hey, maybe this stretch should be removed for fish bio impairments or macroinvertebrate bio impairments. So. That's, That's a very good point. Thank you for sharing that. And I understand where you're coming from and I agree. It would be ideally if we get to a point where the Sand Creek could support a, you know, a healthy fish population, wouldn't that be great? So then it gives us indication that we're cleaning up the, the Sand Creek, which is nice. So thank you. Any other questions or comments? If not, uh, Melissa, you are you next on the agenda with uh, uh, program updates? Yes. I, oh, no, no. I think. Nope, not yet. Okay, sorry. Ryan, do you have that? You, yeah. Yep. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, should I jump in? I don't know if you want to announce that uh, this item, the contract amendments. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so uh, this is a uh, uh, agenda item, just uh, information for uh, contract amendments for both um, SRF and Interflu. Uh, so these are our design consultants for our two CIPs. And we wanted to inform the WPC that um, we now know as we've gotten into these projects uh, that we need to, or we're looking to request uh, an amendment to each of the contracts to add additional uh, dollars to the contract. So um, we we knew that uh, the interflu contract was going to be a little bit light. Uh, we were trying to get it under a hundred thousand dollars, and so we actually had asked that they cut some of their um, uh, construction observation hours from the beginning. So we kind of anticipated this was going to happen. Um, and so what, why we waited this long is that if all of a sudden other items, uh, came in less than they had anticipated, maybe we wouldn't have needed an amendment, but, um, that, that didn't end up happening. Uh, so based on, uh, Interflu needing to be out on the site a little more than they were for the last project, because of uh, the size of it and the, the duration is going to be longer for construction. Uh, they're estimating about an additional 30,000 would need to be added um, to the contract to ensure that they would be out on site during the critical times of construction, which would be our log placement and the log piles. Uh, so um, they uh, are very particular on you know where they want uh, the logs to be placed depths, all those sort of things. And so it, it is important to have them out there uh, for those times. And so um, we kind of know that uh, that we that this one is uh, would be quite important to the project to, to increase those funds and have them out there. Um, SRF, we when we initially did the uh, request for proposals, we weren't sure which project was gonna go first for construction. So we were still lining up grants and this one ended up kind of taking a back seat. And so, you know, they didn't really anticipate by the time, you know, that they did their proposal, which was in 22 to when we actually could start construction is gonna be 2024, um, you know, that there's just enough time passed that, um, that prices do change during that, that time period. Um, and also that we need them as well to be on site for construction observation. And that's probably the bigger piece of it is that we're not sure if we'll have staff from our highway department. It's too hard to tell. Um, and I just talked to the manager uh, last week about it and he was thinking that they probably won't have anybody. And so if that's the case, you know, we've re really utilized them to help us with those on site inspections. So we kind of need one of the SRF staff to be available on site for a lot of that project and so uh, once again pretty critical to the project having somebody out there ensuring that's built properly um, so we just wanted to inform the wpc that 
uh, we'll be pursuing those amendments here in the not too distant future, especially the inner flu one. We got to get rolling on that one pretty quick. And so with that, I'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Ryan. Any questions for uh, Ryan in terms of follow-up commissioners? Very good. Hearing none, now I think we can move on to Melissa. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so in your packet uh, was a Shallow Lake seminar uh, news release and um, a copy of the postcard that we sent out. And just to remind you of some of the background again. So two years ago in 2021, when we um, had a drought year, um, we had received lots of emails and phone calls from lake residents on certain lakes that were very concerned about you know, the low water levels, rocks, plants. Um, the changes were pretty um, dramatic. Um, and that's because we have a lot of shallow lakes here in Scott County, you know, more than half of our lakes are considered shallow, which means um, that they are less than 15 feet on average in depth. Um, so there's shallow lakes and there's deep lakes and they both act very differently. Um, so in response to that, we thought it would be good to educate um, uh, our lake residents and kind of give them um, what to expect, uh, you know, for a shallow lake, especially through um, season changes and situations like we're currently still in, in a drought year. Um, so we've put together the Shallow Lake Seminar. We're holding it on October 11th, which is a Wednesday night. Um, arrivals will begin at about 5.30. The first presentation will begin at six o'clock. Um, so the first presenter is Joe Bischoff from Bar Engineering. Um, he will talk about shallow lake ecology, kind of the basics of shallow lakes, um, what people can expect, you know, what are, what are the dynamics with vegetation and water quality in, in a lake like that. And then the second presentation will be um, Steve McComas from Blue Water Science, and he'll talk about lake management strategies. So what can we do um, about certain situations on a shallow lake and what can homeowners do? Um, and then there'll be some time for questions. So um, we mailed out a postcard to all the residents on Cedar, McMahon, O'Dowd, and Thole Lakes. So all those lakes were direct mailing but we're also doing the news release so that others can sign up as well. Um, so that reached everybody's mailbox this past week. Um, and we've got some people signing up already. It's a, it's a small number, but we expect to have more hopefully um, coming along. Um, so the deadline is September 11th to sign up because that's kind of our cutoff for our catering order. Um, and that's being held at Mystic Lake Event Center. So. Um, hopefully we'll get lots of attendees. We're hoping for at least 300. So we'll see how that goes. Um, the logo in branding, you know, creating a new logo for us is, is underway. Um, I talked to you a little bit about some questions. So we did a complete um, inventory of questions from the woman uh, that we're working with at Studio Lola, Jamie. Um, and now we're in the process of creating an inspiration board. Um, you know, kind of picking out colors and fonts and inspirational photos, which will kind of be the big picture that'll help um, create that logo. Um, so more to come on that next month. The Eagle Scout project um, that you heard from Nick Staying a couple months ago, um, I ordered the native plants and the erosion control blanket for that project. Um, those will be delivered on September 12th. I'm having them delivered to me so I can care for them for a few days. Um, the reason is, um, you know, August is usually a really typically hot month. So we want to wait till about September to plant these. And the first weekend is Labor Day weekend. Everyone's busy. The second weekend, I, I guess, is Jordan has a big celebration, annual celebration. So Nick and his dad said that's probably a bad weekend to do it. So we're shooting for the weekend of September 15th through the 17th for Nick to, to install the project. So um, I've been really busy with one watershed, one plan <laughs> stuff um, in the planning process. So we've been working on measurable outcomes and implementation table and lots of meetings um, with that. 
we did just recently get the first three chapters to review. So the consultant sent those to us as kind of a preliminary review um, of the steering committee and advisory committee. And I believe the policy committee were sent that link. So those comments are due this week, Wednesday, August 30th. So I'll be working on that tomorrow. Um, last month on July 27th, I attended uh, an aquatic plant ID workshop. Um, it's been a long time since I went to one of those, but it was great. Um, there was a lot of different plants. I learned a lot of things that um, uh, I didn't know about certain plants because I don't see um, certain plants on our lakes. They're kind of pretty much the same native plants. Um, so that was good. I uh, talked to a few people that I know in the field. So um, as Vanessa mentioned, the county fair, we had a display that um, I created a map of all the public accesses, um, kind of a table showing, uh, well, it's a table of basically a list of all the public accesses, who owns it, who to contact about that access. And then we created a large kind of a table or chart that listed all the water bodies and then different uh, water body recreational activities. And so it was kind of an activity for the public to participate in. They could put a sticker next to their favorite water body and a sticker next to their favorite recreational activity. Um, and so we got some people to participate and it was really kind of a good um, conversation starter um, for the booth. So that went well. Um, we received an email, we were reached out um, by the Minnesota Well Owners Organization and um, about a water testing clinic that they're holding um, with some local partners. Uh, it's kind of also turned into an environmental health fair, but they're holding a water testing clinic at the Elko New Market Library on Saturday, September 30th, where people can bring, you know, private well owners can bring a water sample to get tested for nitrates. And some can test for chlorides for free. Um, the Well Owners Association contact that sent the information said that they have a limited number of um, chloride samples that they can offer for free. So if anyone is interested in taking a water sample there, it'll be at the Elko New Market Library on September 30th. It runs from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. that day. Um, I've also been working on putting together a data analysis um, services request to have an outside consultant um, analyze the Credit River monitoring data that the SWCD is collecting for us this year, and then also to have them um, do some data analysis for the Sand Creek watershed that the SWCD will be uh, monitoring for us in 2024. Um, we haven't really had an in-depth um, look at that data. And so we really want to have, um, you know, a consultant that's really good with those statistics and data analysis to kind of give us a, a, a good picture of what the water quality is looking like throughout the watershed to inform our next plan update that we'll be starting next year. Um, so hopefully I can finish that up soon and um, we can get, uh, I think we're gonna be working with BAR. They're really good with data analysis and get them on board um, so they can start right away in January of next year. And the last thing I have is also to kind of help inform the next plan update and to start thinking about things. I was approved to attend the Midwest Climate Resiliency Conference in Duluth at the end of October. Um, I read over the program. There's some really good topics. Um, for those of you that might remember, I gave a presentation, I think about a year ago, on the precipitation and temperature trends that we're seeing in Minnesota um, throughout the 125 years of data that we have that we're on a warming trend. And so this conference, I think, will uh, some of the really good topics, I think, will be to how to help uh, start that conversation just with the public in general on, on our climate extremes that we're seeing and uh, maybe even what we can do to help with that. So 
So with that, Mr. Chair, that's all I have. And I'm open to any questions anyone might have. Thank you, Melissa. Any uh, questions or follow-up uh, clarification issues that you would like to address with Melissa, commissioners? Okay, very nice job, Melissa, very good. Next then is the uh, One Watershed, One Plan um, update by Rita and myself. And uh, I have to admit, I was hoping Rita would be doing this rather than me. Um, so I really don't have anything firm to report. Maybe if um, Vanessa or somebody wants to add some updates, maybe it'd be okay. Absolutely, um, Mr. Chair and Commissioners, I'm happy to add a few notes. Um, as Melissa mentioned, the uh, One Watershed, One Plan planning partnership has been uh, moving along. And as everybody remembers, we committed to just the planning portion of this um, to hopefully uh, get our priorities upstream there in Rice and Lesueur counties where the headwaters is for Sand Creek. And by doing that um, and getting good practices and priorities and up there, it would reduce the effort that we have to do down here. Um, so there was a lot of benefit to us coordinating in that. Um, the partnership did decide to uh, move towards forming an actual entity um, for the second phase, which is the implementation phase. Uh, and the county is not interested in joining another entity uh, as we in the county and the WMO already have more than sufficient water resource entities covering that work here. Uh, we don't really see the benefit of doing that level of work. Um, so we'll be stepping back for that portion um, and we'll just continue to, you know, focus on the work that we're doing here rather than hand off some of those duties to another entity that um, is probably better focused upstream. Um, but that being said, the planning work that we're doing um, is still really helpful. And it, again, really will help us get our priorities coordinated uh, for upstream to help uh, improve the work that we do down here. So as that kind of uh, starts to wind down to a close, uh, as, as both kind of you know, Virgil and uh, Commissioner, uh, Virgil, sorry, Commissioner Pint and Commissioner Weaver, apologize, um, have mentioned, you know, they've been moving through this process uh, for quite some time now. As it starts to wind down, uh, you know, it'll come to a close for the plan review, and then the plan uh, gets approved by Bowser, and then um, those entity partners uh, can go off and, and go ahead and implement it. Uh, it does appear at this moment that the Soil and Water Conservation District is likely leaning towards uh, joining that partnership. And if that is in fact the case, uh, we would probably liaison with them if there were specific projects or activities uh, that entity was doing, uh, we would just simply use the SWCD rather than try to duplicate or create redundancies. Obviously we don't like to duplicate within our area. We feel like, um, that's uh, not a good efficient use of, of our services. And so we try to do as much liaison and partnering as possible, but keep redundancies down. So we'll probably utilize the SWCD with that partnership moving forward if that's uh, the way that they choose. So that's a pretty succinct update. Um, Commissioner Pint, if there's anything else you wanted to add or uh, Melissa, if there's anything else you thought maybe we missed. No, this is Commissioner Pant. Yeah, I, I would add, yes, I, I agree with you 100% that there's tremendous benefit for us um, from a planning perspective, because you, like you said, we can have our priorities being implemented in terms of part of their plan. Um, it benefits all of us, right? So I'm definitely in agreement with that uh, position. Um, and also it made didn't make a lot of sense from our perspective to just create a new entity, a new you know, entity, because we have a very good functioning uh, unit right now. So I think that's probably why the county commissioners were not very much in favor of it also. So I'm in support of the direction we're, we're heading. So thank you for your leadership on this, Vanessa. Okay, any other questions on One Watershed, One Plan? If not, we can move into new business. We have a couple of action items here we have to address. Uh, so Vanessa, you wanna start us off with that? Absolutely, Commissioner Pint. Uh, so this is the time of year when staff brings to the WPC the preliminary levy for the following year and draft budget outline. Uh, 
then um, depending upon the WPC's recommendation, we move it forward to the board uh, for their September meeting. Uh, and just as a reminder, the reason why we do it in this order is because as a special taxing district, uh, we are required to certify our preliminary levy by the end of September. And that is unique to special taxing districts. Uh, and then following that, some of the last minute, uh, last bit of details that we get, like some of our grant information and things uh, that starts trickling in a little bit later in the fall and where we're at with some of our grant programs, we're able to finalize a little bit more accurately. Uh, we bring the full budget and the final levy uh, back to you in November for final approval. So typically from year to year, there's not, a, we have not uh, in the last few years had a significant difference um, if from, from preliminary to final, but just so you know that this is the preliminary levy we are currently proposing. Um, and then to give you an idea of what that preliminary levy will cover, we also give you kind of a draft budget outline. So it's not a full budget, but it's just kind of an idea of what that budget uh, would entail. So without further ado, uh, to meet our existing grant obligations and achieve our watershed management plan goals and maintain our, just to maintain our current service levels, um, we are proposing a levy of $1,417,065 with a draft budget outline right now of $2,504,150. You notice there's a discrepancy between those two numbers, and there is some very good reasons why. The key factors influencing this 2024 budget include, first of all, uh, our overall herbal revenue does remain a little bit lower than it has compared to the last 10 years, although at this point it's kind of starting to balance out. Um, it's just lower in general. That's just going to be what it is. Uh, but due to grants that we are anticipating to come in for 2024, we are expecting that revenue to be up by about $100,000 compared to 2023, which is helpful. Uh, the proposed levy increase is actually going to be only about 1.5%. Uh, this is below the amount proposed in the approved 2019 to 2026 watershed management plan, which if you remember, there's a 2.5% um, annual increase, and then there's a 3% uh, cost of fees services increase, kind of an inflation increase adjustment. Uh, so usually we have an approved in the plan up to about 5.5%. Uh, we rarely hit that. We usually try to stay a bit under it, but depending upon what our needs are for the plan, uh, we sometimes do get near it. This year we're down to 1.5 and there are many reasons why we are not going for more um, simply because we don't need it at this point in time, even though there's a lot of work we're planning on doing. Uh, this 1.5 is in line with both the Scott WMO and county policy for levy increase. The proposed 2024 levy is again, $1,417,065 compared to the 2023 levy of $1,396,123. This is an increase of $20,942. What does this mean for the people? <laughs> what does this mean for the citizens and taxpayers of Scott County? The tax impact is a tax rate decrease of 0.24%. Uh, so our current tax rate is actually 0.929%, and it would bring us down to 0.905. Um, as, as our usual goal, the draft budget is 70%, 73% land and water treatment. That's again, these are the projects that go in the ground, uh, putting, uh, putting funds in the hands of our landowners to implement conservation practices in the ground and our CIPs. So we always try to keep our land and water treatment budget at least 70% or higher of our budget. And uh, we usually have no problems meeting that goal. Um, grants. So as I mentioned, grant information is not particularly well known at this time, uh, but will be available for the final budget review in October and November. Um, grants would reduce the amount of fund balance needed for 2024, but certainly not eliminate it. So we have both uh, new grants that can be coming in, as well as grants that we're currently in the middle of, and we're not exactly sure quite yet how much of those grants we'll spend this year um, to budget for next year. We just know that we have a grant deadline for two of those major grants of August of next year. So cost share demand has slowed down a bit. 
the current budget is really uh, is pretty much good in line with the dedicated baseline fund for the tax program, um, kind of based upon that slowing demand. Um, we are keeping a little bit of an eye on it. We have met with the SWCD last week, you know, to try to make sure that, you know, have we just hit all the low hanging fruits? Have we um, brought out all of the different options out there for types of conservation practices that people are looking for? Um, you know, many other factors that we're kind of taking into consideration. Um, it has slowed down a little bit, but it hasn't slowed down drastically. Um, it just means we have to work that much harder to get projects in the ground and the projects we're getting in the ground might not quite have the same uh, percent uh, pollution reduction than our previous. So the cost benefit might not be as great as the first round, which you would kind of expect um, doing the best first, right? Then you still got to get everybody else just to meet your numbers. So the program areas that are expected to be reduced for 2024 include administration, regulation, coordination, and maintenance. Um, there is uh, an anticipated $158,000 increase to land and water treatment. Uh, this is the targeted projects in order to continue the design and installation of Xanadu stream bank stabilization and Pika Creek ravine stabilization, as well as just basic structural practices that were identified in our watershed-based implementation funding grant from the Board of Water and Soil Resources and the Nine Elements grant from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency slash EPA. So we still have some targeted projects in those two grants we really need to get in the ground because those grants all end at the end of uh, and next year. Um, it is a high priority to complete those two large CIPs, as Ryan mentioned, just to stay on plan and complete the watershed management plan um, before it expires in 2026. As these are really the last two large projects in our CIP for that plan, um, it really would be a great finish to get those in. So that's pretty exciting for us. Um, and Ryan is obviously working really hard on those uh, as well as the SWC helping us in the other ways too. So there is an anticipated $205,000 increase to monitoring uh, for 2024 in order to contribute towards increased data collection and in order for us to inform our next planning cycle. Uh, now we did identify this in our current watershed management plan. So it's not a surprise. It's something you've already read, hopefully, or we can direct you back to where <laughs> we had it put in the plan initially. Um, but specifically, as identified in the plan, there's Sand Creek monitoring, which Melissa was mentioning. Uh, that is about $225,000. It is a very large monitoring effort. <laughs> EPA, in fact, said uh, never again would we do a nine elements grant as big as the one you guys have uh, because Sand Creek is such a large subwatershed. Um, there are agencies smaller than that, so water shed. Um, <laughs> um, uh, there's also the Credit River monitoring, of course, at $36,000, and those are planned for 2024. Again, this is data we really need to inform our next planning cycle so that the plan that we write allows us to really achieve our water resource goals and policies and really just continue the good work that we have been doing. Uh, because again, we are data-driven and science-driven as well as citizen-driven, so we need all those components together. Um, there is an anticipated $44,000 increase to inventory and data analysis to complete those identified activities in the watershed management plan, um, including the U of M social attitude survey. This is where we're reaching out to the residents to get, you know, what are their priorities, what's concerning them most, what's working for them. Um, we did this again several years ago. It's in the plan to repeat it again to help us guide us next planning cycle. That is $50,000. And then uh, multi-purpose district ditch assessment on CD4. Apologize, can't talk. Hold on one second. That's $35,000. Uh, and then there's the Credit River monitoring data analysis at about $40,000. So again, we're ramping up our research just to ensure that we're informing ourselves for the next planning cycle and we're ready to go. Uh, so between ramping up for the next planning cycle and getting our last two really big CIPs in the ground uh, that puts our budget rather high. However, we have a really, really comfortable fund balance right now because we have been setting aside money for these activities, which is why rather than try to increase our levy to something like three or 5% or higher, we would rather just dip into those fund balance reserves that we have been saving and draw from there 
first. So it is anticipated that there is going to be a maximum deficit of four hundred seven hundred and forty thousand dollars in twenty twenty four. We had projected a rather high deficit last year as well. It didn't actually end up being that high. So you know some of that actually kind of rolled over. So was Anna do and peak as Ryan said, uh, going in a little bit over the hill, uh, it kind of shifts that into twenty twenty four. Um. So it's partially planned, um, but it's also partially due to just kind of those slower moving grants. Uh, like we said, uh, just see uh, cost share programs just not moving quite as fast as we were hoping and trying to get more practices in the ground. We were hoping to get more in the ground this year. Unfortunately, we, we still have next year to try. And so we want to roll it into next year instead. So um, the difference again is proposed, like I said, to come out of our restricted fund balances um, that we've been setting aside and some of our unused general fund balance from last year. Um, that still leaves us a very a comfortable fund balance to complete our planning efforts um, for the remaining planning cycle. So um, there is, uh, if you like numbers instead of words, uh, <laughs> there is a um, draft budget outline table at the end of the document as well. Uh, and with that, I stand for any questions and a recommendation from the WPC. Thank, thanks, Vanessa, very nice job. Um, I'll just make a quick observation. It's nice to see with all the great work that we're doing, and even though there's inflation out there in general, we're able to continue to do our projects with actually a slight decrease in the cost to the average homeowner in the county, primarily due to the larger tax base. So excellent job. Any other questions or comments, first of all, before we'd even entertain a motion to endorse? There are no other questions or comments. I would entertain then a motion to recommend uh, approval for the proposed uh, preliminary levy. Someone want to make a motion to approve? Hi, this is Commissioner Beerling. I'll make a motion to approve. There has been a motion. Is there a second to the motion? This is Commissioner Casilius. I'll second the motion to approve. Good. There's been moved and seconded then to have uh, pro the proposed levy uh, approved and recommended for approval. We'll take a roll call vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner Pitt. Aye. Commissioner Casilius. Aye. Commissioner Thill. Aye. Commissioner Schmidt? Aye. And Commissioner Veerling? Aye. Thank you, Commissioners. Great, thank you. Next, Ryan, we're gonna talk about our fall tour. Yes, Mr. Chair, Commissioner. So our fall tour um, is coming back. So I think everybody's pretty familiar uh, with it, obviously. Um, you know, the, the last one we did, our last couple that we did were a little modified, um, due to COVID. And so this, uh, tour that's being proposed is more of our traditional, what we had been doing for a number of years. So hopefully everyone has received their save the date. Um, so it would have been sent to you by the SWCD. And so the date is, uh, Monday, September 18th. And the tour would go from 3 to 7 p.m. Um, that would include uh, dinner. And there would be transportation if you wanted to use it. You don't have to. Um, to and from all the sites. So we would probably um, park at wherever the, the dinner would be held. And then uh, everyone would hop on the uh, bus and then uh, drive us to the various sites and then bring us back to where um, the, the dinner would be at the end. Um, so there will be more details though, as we get closer, we have had uh, one meeting kind of uh, soil and water and WMO staff getting together and, and uh, working on some of the details, but more still needs to be done. Uh, and so as we get closer, you will um, get more information about it. Um, and then uh, the RSVPs will come out as well. Um, also, the second part of this, the action item. Oh, first, I should say, if anyone has not received 
uh, there, save the date, let me know uh, so I can pass that along to you. Second part of this is uh, normally we would uh, have the uh, tour um, sort of uh, become our September WPC meeting uh, where we wouldn't have a tour and then still hold the WPC meeting as well. Um, so if we wanted to, uh, we could uh, move our regular meeting to be the tour, um, but we would officially need to do so. Um, and if not, then we would just hold our uh, uh, WPC meeting a week later from the tour. So the following Monday, the 25th, um, staff recommends uh, moving it. Uh, just because we we won't have any um, action items or there's nothing big that's anticipated um, for September. So moving it and uh, not um, doing a regular meeting uh, would be just fine. So um, Vanessa, if there's anything else uh, you wanted to add? Nope, you uh, did a great job. Like I said, commissioners, it's just a little technicality because normally we just have this at your September meeting date. And when we set the meeting schedule uh, in January this year, we did not know that the tour would end up being a week early. And so um, you certainly have the option to, to move your meeting date to again, coincide with the tour. Uh, you just have to make a motion to do so if, if that is something you would like to do. Thanks, thanks, Vanessa, and thanks, Ryan. And we're excited to have the tour back on again, as we truthfully have had it. And I believe it makes a lot of sense. I'm sure we'll have a quorum there anyway, even if there is an action item, to, because of scheduling conflicts, entertain a motion to move our regularly scheduled meeting from September 25th to September 18th. Someone want to make that motion? Commissioner Beerling. Did you catch that? Everybody catch it? I, I didn't catch who actually made the motion. It was Commissioner Thill. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's been moved. Is there a second to the motion? Commissioner Beerling, I'll second that. Great. It's been moved and seconded that we move our regularly scheduled 20, September 25th. Watershed Planning Commission meeting to September 18th due to scheduling conflicts. Let's take a roll call vote on that, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Pint? Aye. Commissioner Casillas? Aye. Commissioner Thill? Aye. Commissioner Schmidt? Aye. And Commissioner Veerling? Aye. Thank you, commissioners. We do look forward to seeing you at the tour. If you're not able to make it, we will take many great pictures as we always do. Um, and you can always send somebody in your place. Great. Nothing else left on the agenda. If anybody else has a comment, uh, please speak up. If not, we would entertain a motion to adjourn. This is Commissioner Casilius. I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Is there a second? Commissioner Veerling, I'll second that. It's been moved and seconded to, to adjourn the meeting. Roll Thank call you, vote. Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner Pint. Aye. Commissioner Casilius. Aye. Commissioner Phil. Aye. Commissioner Schmidt. Aye. And Commissioner Veerling. Aye. Thank you, commissioners. And again, too, uh, if you can make it to, to the volunteer appreciation picnic as well that month, we'd love to see you at that as well. Um, and again, if we don't see you before, have a wonderful late summer and have a wonderful early fall. Thank right. you. Thank Thanks you, everybody. Yeah. Bye.